today I'm going to talk about vitreous opacities and vitreous floaters. So I wanted to express some gratitude for a couple of people. Um, one is Lillian uh, in our office who has helped us extensively um, with our presentations. And I'm really grateful to her for that. Um, and this is a picture of her here. And also, I'd like to express gratitude to Jerry Seabag, who is a vitreo retinal surgeon in California, who has been a pioneer in vitreous opacities and floaters. And, and not only is he a, a very erudite and sophisticated person, but he has, he has been consistently and politely pushing this field forward for many decades, particularly given the attitude that many of us have towards patients with floaters and dismissing their symptoms. And he's been very gently and persistently moving the field in the right direction. So first we'll start with vitreous anatomy. And over here on, on the left panel, you can see a autopsy eye in which the uh, choroid, uh, the sclera was removed and the choroid was dissected anteriorly. And then the vitreous base was dissected off of the retina. And you can see that early in life, the vitreous gel is firm, it's very clear, and, and it's, it has a structure. It doesn't just collapse when you set it on a, on a surgical cloth. And if we look at the eye and cross section, we can see that um, the, the vitreous emanates from the aura serrata, and it's always connected to this space during life. There's a little space right here, and then the vitreous is connected to the lens. Um, and this space here behind the lens, the posterior capsule, is called burger space or the retrolental space of ergolet. Um, there are fibers that extend up to the pars plana and even the pars baccata, and these aren't shown on this diagram, but we know that those exist because when we're operating on patients with proliferative retinal diseases, we can see contraction with the retina actually gets pulled from here up onto the ciliary body. And by coming across with a cutter and shaving those vitreous bands, we can release that traction. Um, there's Cloquet's canal, which um, emanates from the disc. And if we blow the space up here, we can see this, this area a little better. There's this little space here, a little space behind the capsule, and then this tight adhesion between the anterior vitreous face and the posterior capsule. And this is why cataract surgeons get uh, vitreous loss when they break the posterior capsule. It isn't because they're you know, going crazy back here. It's, it's because whenever the capsule is torn, it often actually breaches the vitreous face right here. If we look during development at a neonatal or, uh, or embryonic eye, we see the, the lens. Um, with the embryonic nucleus and the, the fetal uh, nucleus. And then we see the tunica vasculosa lentis, which is contiguous with Cloquet's canal and this branch of vessels. And this regresses over time and forms a, a little tuft in adults. This is a, 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 a uh, embryonic or neonatal lens. And when we do retinopathy prematurity exams, which I, I don't do anymore, but I did when I ran the neonatal intensive care unit service at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, we can see these, uh, these lenses, these blood vessels on the lens. And in fact, when we're doing laser for retinopathy prematurity, we try to avoid the bigger lenses in order to avoid causing a subcapsular cataract. And here's an example of a, a incompletely regressed Bergmeister's papilla the remnant of the uh, Cloquet's canal. And this is a picture from Dr. Henry Kaplan, who is a famous ophthalmologist in Louisville, specialist, a specialist in many things, including um, uveitis. So here is some, some work where we're comparing an embryonic vitreous to a middle age vitreous to an aged vitreous. And one of the problems we have with examination of the vitreous is that the optics aren't ideal. We're unable to get the slit arm far enough over to examine the posterior vitreous effectively because of the optics of, of the pupil. And it, if we take the, uh, the vitreous out and then look at it with uh, these effects, we can create what's called a Tyndall effect. And we can see that in the embryonic 
uh, vitreous. There's the only abnormality is cloacase canal. Otherwise, it is uniform and homogeneous and dark. By the time we're in middle age, say my age, um, this is what our vitreous looks like. I can see these little dots, and I can see these strands now if I lay on my back and and look at the look at clouds in the sky, which I I used to see a few when I was a kid, but I I had this experience recently of of laying on my back for the first time in decades, and I was impressed by the extent of degeneration. And by the time we're aged, our vitreous is very cinematic, uh, condensations, fibrils, clouds, and okay, this can be very disturbing to patients. Another important concept, this is actually an OCT of my eye with the Heidelberg system. And you can see that my vitreous was still attached when this was taken. I think it still is today. But I put this picture up here in order to show the precortical vitreous pocket. Um, this is a abnormality that, not an abnormality, but this is an anatomical feature that is seen on OCTs. And it's important to distinguish this from a PVD. It can be confusing if, if you're not aware of, of these subtleties. And here's an example of, of this pocket um, in a surgical case. And, and I use this during surgery all the time. I'll sometimes uh, tear or cut a hole in the anterior surface of the pocket towards the lens. And then I can grab a hold of it with a vitrector in order to help create a PVD or posterior vitreous detachment. Typically, we'll do this uh, adjacent to the disc. But if we have trouble, sometimes We'll grab a hold of it here with a retractor or forceps. In this case, it's been stained with kinolog or triamcinolone diacetinide in order to make it more visible. So a few surgical pearls, uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, the vitreous chamber is actually larger than we thought it was. It's about 4.6 mils in women and about 5 mils in men. And we used to think it was about 4. Uh, and it was very frustrating to me that that I would I would run out of oil sometimes in a myopic patient, even though I had like seven mils. And so there is a, a great deal of variability in the vitreous volume. And these studies were done using uh, MRIs, and you can see an MRI here, and this is the uh, the rendered vitreous volume from this MRI study. Another interesting thing is the posterior vitreous cortex, or that posterior hyaluronic membrane, increases in thickness over time. It is a true basement membrane, and it's contiguous with the internal limiting membrane. And it stains with brilliant blue G, which is seen here in this paper from Osdom et al. in 2002. And we use this during surgery. Uh, brilliant blue G is safer than endocyanin green. And so it's an um, excellent dye for staining the internal limiting membrane to prevent recurrences of apparental membranes and to increase the success rate of macular hole surgery. Interestingly enough, the posterior visual cortex does not stain with ICG. And so BBG not only stains the posterior vitreous cortex, but also stains the internal limiting membrane. So it's very useful dye in that sense, as long as you don't get confused. 